what is true intimacy between a husband and wife? And what are some of the traits of a healthy family? Gary Chapman is a well-known marriage counselor and author and has been on the New York Times bestseller list since 2007 with over 20 million copies sold. And you may know his most popular book, The Five Love Languages. Today, he's here to talk about his book, Five Traits of a Healthy Family. You're going to want to stick around for the things you need to know in navigating your marriage and your family. And so, you know, you talk about marriage in your book, which is part of your love language resources. And what are the early years of marriage? Why are they hard? And can you share what happens, what happened to your your marriage? Yeah, I think one reason that uh, the early years are often difficult is because, first of all, we're not prepared that we're going to come down off the high that we call being in love. <laughs> I was always told, if you've got the real thing, it's going to last forever. <laughs> That's yeah. not true. Uh, we've studied it now. Uh, the average lifespan of that euphoric state that we call being in love or falling in love is two years. Some a little longer, some a little less. Average two years, and we come down off the high. Mm -hmm. uh, no one told me that. And so my wife and I had dated two years before we got married. I came down pretty soon after the honeymoon. And we realized we disagreed on a lot of things. And we didn't do that when we were in love. I mean, when you're in love, whatever they want is fine, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And we all know that. <laughs> and so I think the problem is exactly what we discovered. Uh, we didn't know how to solve conflicts because we hadn't had any. And so we ended up arguing because in my mind, I knew I was right. Whatever the topic, I was right. She knew she was right. And she, I would try to convince her and she'd try to convince me. And, and then we ended up yelling at each other, you know. And then not only did we lose the positive feelings, now I had negative feelings toward her. Wow. And I'm thinking, man, how could it be so fast that I come down and now we feel this? And, yeah. and I began to think I've made a mistake, you know, and, and I, yeah. I, I, I kind of blame God because I said, you know, I prayed before I got married. Don't let me marry her if she's not the right one. And yeah. you let me do it. I'm kind of I got upset with God, <laughs> which is crazy, you know, crazy. Yeah. Uh, we we had a hard time in our marriage. And I, and I think that's probably what God used to give me empathy for people uh, because I've invested my life in counseling couples on how to have a good marriage. Yeah. And I think if we had not gone through that, I would not have had empathy for people who said, we don't have any hope. We, we feel like we're too different. We don't agree on anything. And we think we just ought to bail out. And, and I have empathy for people that feel that way, you know, and I sometimes have said to them, you know, I, I can understand how you get to that place. So I'm not going to ask you, do you want to work on your marriage? Because by then the want to is gone. Yeah. What I'm asking is, will you work on your marriage? Mm. And I say, I understand you don't have any hope. So would you be willing to go on my hope for a while? Because I have hope. I've been there. I've helped other couples who've been there. And I have hope for you. So if you'll go on my hope and you and you choose, we will work on our marriage. Let's just see what happens. And yeah. when they when they're willing to when they see that I'm being realistic and not trying to whitewash their pain and their hurt, most of the time they're open to say, Okay, well, we don't we don't know how it can work out, but we're willing to we're willing to try. So uh yeah, I think, you know, God uses the positive and the negative things that happen in our lives to not only help us, but to help us help others. Do you think we could turn, you know, a relationship around like totally? Because um, you may have like many, many years of people that are just not getting along, not getting, but they stay together anyway, because they know there's something there, but they just can't figure out what. And, and, you know, what do you think? Can the relationship take a turn? I think it can. And I think you're right. I think there are couples that have had long-term marriages. They're not healthy marriages. Uh, they're more like roommates, you know, living in the same house. They try to be civil. They don't, they, they may not argue because they just kind of given up, you know, and they just let each one do what they want to do. Uh, and that's not a healthy marriage. Uh, but I think if that, if that couple is willing to 
begin to look at things differently and, and discover new ideas. For example, the whole love language thing that I've had many people say, Gary, that love language book saved our marriage. I mean, we were ready for divorce and we read that book and realized how we had, we had lost, not only had we lost the negative feelings, but we, we just didn't even like each other anymore. Mm-hmm. And we realized that it, if we that we each had a different love language. And, and so we took the quiz and then we started, well, let's just try this, you know, mm-hmm. and we started speaking each other's language. And before long, we began to feel positive toward each other because we were receiving and giving love in the right love language. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, you have the emotional encouragement now. Yeah. Well, let, let's work on some of these other things that we've had problems with through the years, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that's why I say to them, I said, you know, this kind of love doesn't begin with a feeling. Falling in love begins with a feeling. This kind of love doesn't begin with a feeling. It begins with a choice. Hmm. We're married and we're going to choose to try to learn how to express love to the other person in a way that's meaningful to them. And as Christians, of course, we have God's help because Romans chapter five and verse five says the love of God is poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So we have outside help. And, and we can even be honest with God and say, you know, Lord, you know, I don't have any positive feelings toward him or toward her. Mm-hmm. I've lost all of that. But I know you love them. Mm-hmm. And I'm a, I'm asking you to pour your love into my heart and let me be your agent for loving them, even though I don't feel love for them. Yeah. And so this it, it begins with that feeling and that attitude and then with the help of God. And you can you can love them in a, in a meaningful way. And when that when that happens, then the emotions begin to return. So, yeah, I, I have hope for all couples if they're willing to do some things differently. <laughs> That's the thing. And, you know, sometimes I'm seeing a lot of women in their relationships that are just stubborn. Yeah. They don't want the pride gets in the way. They don't want to give it up. They they think they're right. They think he's wrong. You know, that that's so damaging because you're not listening, like you're saying, and using maybe this love language book. To just be able to try to turn things around. So what would you give like a newly married man? What what kind of advice would you give him? First of all, uh, read my other book called Things I Wish I'd Known Before We Got Married. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Even if you're newly married, read it. Yeah. yeah. 12 12 things I know now, had I known earlier, would have made my marriage much easier. So even in the early years, year of marriage, I'd say, a couple will work through that book. They'll be learning how to process things in a positive way yeah. and will likely have a much, much, much better marriage. What, why is listening such a big factor in marriage? I think because we can't read each other's mind. We don't know what they're feeling. We don't know what they're thinking unless they reveal that. And that's communication. It's revealing to each other. Uh, what's going on in my mind, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And and we have to listen to each other, but not just listen, listen empathetically. Mm-hmm. That is, try to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and look at the world through their eyes. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you'll agree with them, but if you'll listen, you can come to understand what they're thinking and what they're feeling and why they're thinking that way and why they're feeling that way. And then you can honestly say, you know, honey, uh, I think I'm beginning to understand what mm-hmm. you're thinking and what you're feeling. And I can see how that makes sense. Yeah. You know, and now and, if both of you will listen, then you can say, okay, now how can we solve the problem? And you spend your energy finding a solution rather than trying to win the argument. Yeah. I, I sometimes said this, Nancy, if you win an argument with your spouse, they lost. Mm-hmm. It's no fun to live with a loser. Yes. So why would you create a loser? We're on the same team. Yeah. Uh, let, let's stop trying to win win the battle. We're on the same team. Let's learn how to work together to accomplish good things in life. Yeah. And and, the, you, and you keep bringing to my mind the assumptions that someone else has about someone else's thoughts. Yeah. It, it's such a big factor, right? And you're assuming the person thinking that way, but are they really thinking that? Are you are you asking them or do what do you think? But yeah. you know, let's see. What is true intimacy between a husband and a wife? Why is it so important in a marriage? Well, I think that many people, uh, especially men, when you say intimacy in a marriage, they're thinking about the sexual part of the marriage. 
It's far, far more than that. It includes that, to be sure. But it's it's intellectual intimacy. It's sharing our thoughts, our ideas with each other. And, and if we shoot each other's ideas down, we stop sharing them. But it's, it's listening as we share ideas, intellectual intimacy, and then emotional intimacy. And that's where the love language comes in. You know, meeting that emotional need for love, social intimacy. It means we do things together. And, and maybe it's something, maybe your wife likes the symphony and you don't even know what an oboe is, you know, but because you're married, you say, well, honey, let me do something with you that, and let's, let's just go to the symphony together. And maybe I can learn how to appreciate this, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's social intimacy. And it's, it's spiritual intimacy. It's sharing our walk with God. And I don't mean preaching to each other. You know, I don't mean saying, I read this this morning in the Bible and you need to hear this. You know, I don't mean <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> I, I mean, what you're really, what you're saying is, honey, I read this this morning. It was really meaningful to me. I just want to share it with you. You know, it's just sharing our journey with God together. Yeah. And, and then, yes, there is physical intimacy, but you're not likely to have physical intimacy if you don't have intimacy in these other areas, because life is a whole and, uh, you know, so, I mean, you know, certainly a husband can have a sexual experience with his wife when they when they're disconnected these other ways, uh, if she's willing to do that, which is very hard for her, because if you don't have a connection emotionally and spiritually, you know, and socially, it, it's hard to be intimate uh, sexually. So yeah. it's all tied together. But in a healthy family there will be an intimate relationship between the husband and the wife. In fact, I think it's it's kind of the starting place. Mm. You know, it, it drives me to the next question of, you know, why is it hard for couples to relate on a deeper emotional level? Why is it hard? I think because we are by nature self-centered. And there's a good part to that because it means we get sleep, we get exercise, we eat food, we take care of ourselves. But when that becomes selfishness and we we come into the relationship in terms of what can I get out of it? And people who have this attitude, these are the people who will say eventually, you're not making me happy and I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Because they're, what they're saying is I'm in this relationship for you to make me happy. Well, that's the opposite of the biblical pattern. The biblical pattern is love. Mm -hmm. And love is I'm in this relationship to try to enrich your life. I want to help you become the person you believe God wants you to be. And we choose our attitude. We don't choose our emotions. Our emotions just happen based on circumstances. We choose our attitude. And when we have an attitude of love, every day we're saying, Lord, show me how I can enrich the life of my wife today or my husband today. Mm -hmm. And when you have that attitude, you'll find ways to express, you know, love and help and them and, and when that happens, you, it's, a, it's an attitude of service. Love is an attitude of service. And, and I believe that's fundamental, not only in the marriage, but also teaching the children how to yes. serve each other, how to serve mommy, how to serve daddy. As they get older, we're taking it outside the family. We're, we're taking the children with us as we serve other people. It may be at the food kitchen. It may be something like raking leaves for a next door neighbor who's too old to rake leaves in the fall. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, what we're communicating to our children in our family, we serve other people. Yeah. You know, let's face it. The deepest meaning in life is found in serving other people. Mm -hmm. Je Jesus said about himself, I did not come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for others. We don't have to give our lives a ransom. He's already done that. But we follow his example. We have an attitude of service in the family and then taking it beyond the family. That's wonderful. And, you know, I just have to ask you, what are the five traits that help create a healthy family? Well, I think a couple of them we've talked about. And one of them, as we just discussed, is an attitude of service. In a healthy family, there will be an attitude of service. And then there will be intimacy between the husband and the wife. Then the parents will teach and train the children. And those words, teach and train, one of them emphasizes words. And the other emphasizes actions. And if we're going to teach our children how to grow up and be responsible people, we have to use both of those. For example, if we say uh, we have a rule in our house now that we do not throw the ball inside the house. We throw the ball in the backyard, but not in the house. And if you throw the ball inside the house, we'll have to put it in the trunk of the car for two days and you will lose the privilege. 
And if you break something, we'll have to pay for it out of your allowance. Okay? Now the child knows what the guideline is. They also know what's going to happen if they break the rule. But if they throw the ball in the house, you say, honey, you remember the rule? And they start crying. <laughs> so, yes. Well, you know what has to happen, right? Yes. So we have to put the ball in the trunk of the car. So let's do that. And I don't know what the vase cost. We'll have to find out and we'll have to take it out of your allowance. Uh, but listen, I love you so much because usually you, but you keep the rules. Mm-hmm. So, so you're, you're teaching them with words and actions that there's some things we do. There's some things we don't do. And if they don't do those things, then they have to suffer the consequences. Yeah. So in a healthy family, that's what will be happening. We'll be using words and actions to teach and train our children. In a healthy family, the children will be obeying and then honoring their parents and honor comes after they learn obedience it is they're recognizing you as the parent you set the rules you ha- you tell them the consequences you walk them through all of that and you love them in the middle of everything whether they're disobeying or not disobeying and they come to honor you and respect you and and we're preparing them for adulthood you know one of the things i, I talked to, pu- to public school teachers they say, Gary, we spend half our time just trying to keep order in the class so we can teach because the children don't respect the authority of the teacher. Well, if they don't learn to respect the, respect the authority of the parents, they won't, they won't kick that to school. But if they respect parents and they're, that they are the parent and they make the rules, they will tend to respect the teacher. And we set them up for success in life if we have a healthy family. And that's why I'm excited about this book. Uh, I think it's going to help people not only know what a healthy family looks like, but practical ideas on how to build a healthy family. And even if you came out of a dysfunctional family, you can, you can have, you don't have to, you don't have to follow that pattern. You can have a healthy family. And I think this book's going to help a lot of people do that. Well, there's so much information in this book. I'm, and you can see I've marked so many places in it. Um, so I, I'm hoping that everyone will go and get this book. You can get um, Gary's book, Five Traits of a Healthy Family at Moody Publishers. And you can also go to his website. Um, and what is that, Gary? Five Love Languages.com. The number five, Five Love Languages.com. You can get a little purview on all of my books there. And of course, you can also order them on Amazon as well. Wonderful. And what would you like to leave my audience with today? I would just say, you know, we are where we are. If you came out of a dysfunctional family, that's your history. We can't change our history, but we can change the future. And every single day we make a decision. Am I going to enrich the lives of the people that I live with? Or am I going to be selfish? And that makes all the difference in the world. And the good news is, as I said earlier, we choose our attitudes. So I challenge you every day, Lord, help me today to have the attitude of Christ that I want to enrich the lives, not only of my family, but of anyone else that I encounter. May my life be a positive influence on them. Imagine what would happen if every Christian in the country had that attitude. Thanks for watching The Call, and don't forget to like and subscribe. So join me next time for another episode of The Call with Nancy Sabato. You'll be blessed. Are you listening to The Call of God? Because God speaks to you every day. Are you listening to The Call?